Information that New Delhi has shifted its gaze to the West, especially the United States, which is now India's largest defense equipment supplier. Prime Minister Modi assured President Putin that Russia remains India's principal partner, with over 60% of India's military inventory still being of Russian origin. Defense partnerships apart, nuclear cooperation remains another major pillar of Indo-Russian partnerships. But despite the 12 Russian reactors being constructed in India, India has as yet only received limited transfer of technology. And even though both sides have witnessed a string of regular high-profile visits, Indo-Russian trade has remained abysmally low at only $10 billion. New Delhi's demands for greater access to Russia's abundant oil and gas reserves had in the past met with little enthusiasm from Moscow. But now, with international sanctions on its oil exports, Russia has agreed to increase LNG supplies to India from its Arctic fields and will provide 10 million tons of crude by Rosneft, which is entering into a deal with Oil India. However, with Russia taking on the Western Syria and looking at Pakistan as a market for its military hardware, the question that is high on the minds of most observers, will India now be forced to choose between its traditional all-weather ally Moscow for the United States, which is keen to forge a strategic partnership with New Delhi? And to look at the various strategic issues that are of concern to both Moscow and New Delhi, we have two eminent experts with us on our panel today. We have Mr. Nandan Unikrishnan, who is currently a senior fellow at the ORF and has lived in Russia for several years, both as a child and then as a correspondent. And we have uh, Mr. Bharat Karnad, who is a professor at the CPR and is an author of many important works and a very well-known strategic affairs expert. Dr. Karnad, sir, my first question to you is that Russia has been our biggest defense partner. Russia still has a lot of military clout in the world. It is said that Russia's weaning away towards China and Pakistan as possible export markets is purely to address the demands of the Russian military industrial complex, which looks at India with concern every time India does a deal with a Western country. Is that true? Well, yes, I think it's trying to look at new markets as a counter leverage to India's uh, moving west, as it were, for our military hardware requirements. And I think that's true. And, uh, but I'm not sure that they'll ultimately go ahead and alienate New Delhi by selling really hard stuff in a big sort of way. They might sell a few utility helicopters or something, uh, but it's very unlikely because I don't think Pakistan really has the financial muscle that India has, is not cash rich as India is, and simply is not big enough to carry the international heft that India does. So um, Pakistan is really not, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, a customer Moscow would like to cultivate in the long term. It would like to retain, I think, the kind of links uh, it, we have had, the two countries have had, for going on uh, 50, 55, 60 years, or actually, because the first big deal was the MiG-21 that happened immediately after the uh, 62 war with China. So it's a very strong, very resilient relationship. It, there might be ups and downs, as in most uh, relationships, but I think it retains the kind of longevity uh, that you rarely see in international affairs. Right. Uh, Mr. Unikrishnan, uh, you've known the Russians rather well. Uh, and there seems to be a reasonable amount of affection for India, even amongst the common people there. Uh, at the level of Moscow, it was both an arrangement which was strategically appropriate for both countries, particularly for India. But do you feel the Russians have really felt marginalized ever since India began to expand its strategic discourse? with other Western countries, particularly the United States? No, I think there may have, in some sections of the Russian political elite, there may have been some questions or maybe some suspicion that the relationship is stagnating. But I think overall the political elite, particularly the people on top, if you're talking of President Putin and a few others, uh, I think they understand the significance of India 
as very well put by uh, Bharat about the international heft that India carries. And they are invested in this relationship and they want to see it uh, go forward. It's not just a commercial relationship. You know, it's not just about buying a few arms and all that. There is also much more. And there's a political understanding between the two. Uh, we don't have a single conflict. You know, there is no area of that straight, uh, difference. So in that sense, I uh, don't believe that uh, there is any negativity from the Russian political elite towards India. Right. Uh, Mr. Karnad, uh, it is said that despite first-class technology being transferred to India, the Sukhoi MK1 is the case in point. Uh, there are other military equipment which is top of the line. Even now they are looking at giving us on lease a second Akula class submarine. Uh, Russians have traditionally withheld the real strategic gyan from us in a sense that the services do tend to complain that the real cutting edge strategic information regarding some of this technology was still retained by Russia, which has also been the complaint at some levels about the transfer of technology in the nuclear space, which is the other pillar, a strong pillar of our partnership. Now, is this claim correct or do you feel otherwise? And I think the thing is partially correct, partially in the sense that all winter states really don't give out, uh, you know, hard information in terms of technology transfer. They really do not transfer technology, which means uh, source codes, uh, flight control laws, those kinds of things are not parted uh, for love or money. Uh, so let's be very clear that we haven't got it from the West, we haven't got it from the Soviet Union, but, and this is the great difference that ought not to be forgotten, Russia is the only one that has helped us out in the most strategic, strategically critical and sensitive projects, like the Arihant, like our missile programs, and I could go on. Uh, they are so sensitive uh, that um, Western countries would be loath to forget being associated with such projects. They, in fact, turn around and have sanctioned these projects. So uh, Russians have come through where there is no other uh, option. And they have maintained that position of uh, helping us out, assisting us, without parting with the kind of critical information that no one parts with, as I've just said. But even so, they have been very helpful. They have vetted our designs, uh, helped us over many glitches that many of our critical projects have faced uh, time and again. And therefore, this is a tested relationship and a right. proven relationship. Uh, until, until lately, Mr. Unikrishnan, uh, there was a reluctance on the part of Russia to send to India uh, the kind of oil, hydrocarbon and energy supplies that we wanted. What was the reluctance based on? Did they just have better markets in Europe? Did they have a better potential customer in China? Or was it just purely the distance of shipping it all across to India with or without pipelines? But now I'm told the Russians are now much more open to sending us oil and energy requirements and decreasing our dependence on the Arab world now. Till recent sanctions, uh, Russia was the toast of the hydrocarbon world, as it were. Everyone was investing there. There wasn't a Western multinational which did not have significant stakes in the Russian market. Many of them continue to have it right now, despite the sanctions. So Russia was never looking at India in terms of money. We were not... Uh, a major investor in that sense. India did not uh, appeal to them as a source of technology, which they require, for example, for drilling in the Arctic and all. So therefore, in that sense, India fell somewhere on the sidelines. However, now with uh, the changes in the geopolitical situation, they are looking for support. And uh, given the difficulties their economy is facing, they're even ready to sell some of their crown jewels or at least parts of their crown jewels. And this may be a great opportunity for us to step in and try and secure, at least in part, some of our energy security. The other factor is what you had mentioned in your introduction, uh, uh, which was an impediment, is the lack of ability to deliver gas or oil in India. You know, there is only the sea route, and that is a lengthy process. Uh, this lack of pipelines is a significant impediment.
Right. Uh, it is also said in strategic terms, India expects Russia uh, to support us in our quest for various kind of international agreements and membership of various clubs, whether it is the MTCR, whether it is, of course, uh, the SCO, and most importantly, permanent membership of the UN Security Council, which Russia has always been very forthcoming towards. Uh, but do you think Russia is... It, it, I just want a short answer on this. Do you think Russia can actually bring to bear the kind of clout the Americans have in all these forums? Well, of course not. Uh, in the present situation, they have lost some uh, traction. Uh, but the fact really is that um, it's a larger question whether we should be seeking um, uh, the UN resolution, uh, United Nations Security Council membership and so on, and membership of these other things, uh, nuclear suppliers group, at some other countries' sufferance. Uh, we shouldn't beg for it. I think we reduce ourselves with every passing visitor being, um, you know, badgered for support. It really is demeaning. And I wish the government of uh, India and uh, our agencies generally just kept aloof and just acted on your interests and pursued your interests very hard instead of, uh, you know, making uh, all kinds of compromises with everybody in the hope, in the hope, that they'll consider you a responsible state and then vote for you, uh, vote your membership in. It's not going to happen. No one's as, going to as, give you as, the membership. As you have rightly elaborated in your most recent book, we'll be back after a break to look at other key issues which are of concern to Moscow and New Delhi. But that after a break. Welcome back. We still have our two distinguished guests with us, Mr. Unikrishnan. Russia has more recently, and even Mr. Modi's visit, uh, talked about extending a lot of support to India in battling terrorism. But again, it's fallen short of actually naming Pakistan or uh, addressing India's core concerns about speeding up the 2611 trials. So is Russian support to India in the battle against terrorism very much like American support to India, pure lip service? Well, I think that's being a bit unfair to not just Russia, but the rest of the world. Uh, our battle with terrorism, we have to recognize, A, we have to fight firstly on our own. Right? We have to be prepared to deal with it in any which way that we can. The second point is that, uh, going back again in history, if you remember the battle against the Taliban, there were actually only three countries which were willing to fund the opposition. That is Ahmed Shah Massoud. That was Russia, Iran, and India. Russians have, in a sense, shown where they stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis terrorism uh, with India. I think the visit with uh, Mr. Modi, Mr. Modi's recent visit, has also uh, significantly removed doubts as to what Russia is seeking. And we are on the same page, I think. What we need to do is to be able to together build an international coalition. And we need to... Uh, I mean, to, to try and put it in perspective, there isn't a single global understanding or definition of what constitutes terrorism, and therefore you cannot build a list which everyone shares of who belongs to the terrorist organization. Good point. Good point. And as a result, you have all this confusion. Yeah, true. I mean, yeah, I'll go along with that. Uh, Mr. Karnat, sir, uh, Russia's recent engagements with countries in Asia, uh, the Iran factor, its now physical involvement in Syria and the ongoing crisis in the Middle East, uh, has re-exhibited to us that Russia is not a pushover in world politics, as was the narrative that was coming into play after the Cold War. And one of the things is that they say one of the biggest beneficiaries of Russia's look at Asia policy has been China. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? No, I think that's overstated. I think uh, underlying the Sino-Russian relationship is very deep suspicions and apprehensions of China. But what about uh, the billions of dollars deal that they have done in terms of oil look, pipelines? I know that's really in uh, the making. That is a commercial deal. They have oil, there's excess of oil in the world. They'll try to, you know, sell it to anybody who takes it. 
India can buy too. In fact, that's the whole point about Putin's asking us to increase our equity in the Sakhalin oil fields. So, uh, you know, you shouldn't then um, you know, talk uh, purely commercial deal as, in some sense, geostrategic. The fact is that the Chinese demographic creep into very vacant Siberia, demographic-wise. Uh, Russians are worried. The strategic community there is worried. The, the government in Moscow is hugely worried. And considering that you have uh, economically uh, very powerful China coming up, what Russia fears is that it's going to be, uh, shall we say, um, bottled up both in military sense, because if more, more money is coming to China, uh, the Chinese military will grow more powerful. And I think uh, they're going to end up losing good parts of Siberia and what they call the Pacific Far East. So this is something that the Russians worry about. And it's not something that third parties like us should, in any sense, understate. Mr. Uni Krishnan, quickly, your response to some of those issues, particularly based on uh, the fact that Putin was really the guest of honor in China's big military parade recently, uh, trying to convey a message to the world of some kind of a new relationship between Beijing and Moscow. But equally importantly, I want to go back to Indo-Russia ties. And since you've been in that country, why is it that trade between the two countries is at such a small figure of something like $10 billion as against uh, India-China trade, uh, despite the suspicions we have against the Chinese, which is touching the $70 billion mark, of which Chinese have a huge, uh, almost a $35 billion uh, advantage over us. So some of those issues, uh, strategic and trade. Well, uh, on the China-Russia relationship, I think the relationship has uh, taking into account all the suspicions that Bharat has spoken about. I think it is also important to understand where Russia finds itself currently. And some of the motivation for moving closer to uh, China is, uh, in a sense, to deal with the isolation that the West is trying to impose upon Russia. And that is why you find Russia very active in bodies like the BRICS or SCO. They're trying to prove to the world that they are not isolated and they cannot be isolated. Uh, however, I would tend to broadly agree with what Bharat said that there is a strategic limitation to how far a Russia-China relationship can develop. Although I must say that uh, we need to change our view about uh, the territorial designs, as it were, not uh, from state point of view. The state may have territorial design, but from a people point of view, in fact, currently the reverse is happening. Russian population is trying to move into China because living conditions are better you know, better access to health and other factors. As far as Indo-Russian trade is concerned, one of the biggest impediments is the lack of a stable transport corridor. There is no physical way in which you can quickly deliver goods into Russia. The second is, of course, banking. We don't have any serious banking ties with Russia. Uh, it is very difficult, till recently was, very difficult to take out an LC, a letter of credit, uh, uh, for purchase of goods from Russia, or vice versa. Uh, also, another factor was that the Russians came in in the late 90s and early 2000s with uh, various investment plans, but they went awry, most notably the Sistema investment in MTS. I mean, they were collateral damage to the entire 2G scandal. So uh, their experience has not been too good. So therefore, if you take a conjunction of all these, these are the factors that account for the uh, very low volumes of trade. Uh, however, this time the two leaders have, and I think in this sense, it's a very novel uh, attempt. You're taking your strength, which is military technical cooperation, and trying to kickstart your economic relationship by moving military technical production or manufacture into the private sector. So you're trying to get the private sector involved in manufacture of helicopters, frigates, uh, even partly in nuclear energy, LNT is being involved. So if that succeeds, and you actually in two, three years have a first make in India 
project in the defense sector, then I think the economic relationship may turn around. Well, yeah, I mean, lots of important points have emerged about Indo-Russia relations. Uh, but to summarize, uh, India remains a big market for Russian military weapon systems, and Pakistan does not have the economic muscle to take up the space that India has in Russian military exports. At the same time, uh, Russia and China links, uh, though on the face of it, appear to be improving. There is a lot of suspicion between the two. And also, trade between India and Russia hasn't grown, partly because the transportation corridor between the two countries is visibly absent and so are serious banking ties. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us on the show. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye. Thank you.